Welcome to News Clip. Recently, a tall communist leader, Aithi Shivaraman, passed away. On May 30th, she succumbed to the COVID-19 disease. She was a member of the Communist Party of India Marxist and also one of the early members of the All India Democratic Women's Association, IDWA. She authored two important books, Haunted by Fire and Fragments of a Life. She was also a trade unionist, a working class leader. To speak to us about Maitri Shivaraman, today we have with us Sudha Sundar Raman, the former General Secretary of IDWA and also a close aide of Maitri Shivaraman for nearly 40 years. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us today. Can you tell us, uh, can you actually introduce us to Maitri Shivaraman? Who was she? What did she do? Uh, hello and uh, thank you very much to NewsClick uh, because I think uh, uh, to learn about, know about leaders like uh, Maithali Sivaraman who was so active with the communist movement, the left movement uh, is very, very important uh, and relevant today. Uh, Maithali Sivaraman uh, was uh, a trade union leader as well as a very uh, great leader of the women's movement, both at the national level as well as in Tamil Nadu. Uh, in fact, in uh, Tamil Nadu, she has been one of the founding members and uh, worked towards uh, building up the organization over here. And at the All India level, when the first conference of AIDWA was held in uh, Chennai in 1981, uh, she was right there and they were formulating how Edwa would take up the uh, multi-class, uh, uh, multi-level um, uh, uh, exploitations and oppressions that women suffer from. And she was right there uh, at that time. So she has been uh, with the women's movement and with the trade union movement. And not only that, she also uh, was a great... Uh, um, leader uh, of the untouchability uh, movement over here. She spoke up so much for Dalit rights. She has written a lot about the exploitation suffered by Dalits and much of her work and her writings are about uh, Dalit oppression in uh, agrarian uh, Tamil Nadu. So uh, she was uh, actually a Marxist uh, leader. She was with the CPIM uh, right till the end. So that, she's that kind of uh, leader whom we have lost. Somebody who had a, a privileged education, she came from a comfortable background, but she came uh, on the ground and fought for the people. How did she get inspired to become somebody? That's a very, uh, very interesting story, you know, because she was actually a student uh, in uh, Chennai uh, when uh, she got an uh, opportunity to go abroad. She went to Syracuse University. Uh, and uh, when she was studying over there, doing her master's initially, uh, she was uh, um, very uh, inspired by the major movements, major uprisings that were taking place in the U.S. at that time, uh, which included the anti-Vietnam upsurge. It included all the race uh, issues that were coming up in a very big way. And she identified herself with those protests. And she was extremely inspired by that. And then uh, when she came on to the UN, uh, where uh, she was taken on into that uh, committee on decolonization, uh, she was looking at uh, various uh, issues, uh, human rights issues, larger issues. And uh, she got a chance. She wanted to go to Cuba. In fact, she went to Cuba unofficially. And she went there and she saw what was happening in Cuba. And she was terribly inspired by the sort of revolutionary zeal uh, displayed in Cuba and the way the people's movements over there, the uprising, the rising over there, uh, she was greatly motivated. And these were the things that really informed her. She read a lot. She read much of the literature of that time. And then all this put together, she said that, you know, it's not enough to just learn about these things. I want to do something. I want to make a difference. I want to make a contribution. So with this in mind, she came back to Chennai after about four or five years over there. So she came back to Chennai and uh, she started uh, involving herself with the uh, trade union movement over here. Um, she also made a visit 
uh, to kill when money. Those were uh, the days when a lot of, uh, you know, agricultural unrest was taking place and the agricultural laborers were demanding fair wages. They were also uh, uh, protesting and uh, organizing themselves. There was a terrible uh, incident in uh, a place called Kilvenmani uh, in East Tanjavu, where 44 agricultural laborers, Dalit laborers, they were burnt alive. And this was for uh, demanding higher wages, a very minimal wage increase, actually. And they were burnt alive by the feudal landlords over there. And this was actually not even taken seriously by the ruling state. So she went there along with other activists, local activists, the communists over there. And she made a study of it. She wrote about it. And then she worked it up and in, uh, intervened on that issue. It really changed things both for her also. An intervention was made to the state. Uh, and the state also was exposed as being hand in hands with this kind of exploitation. So this was, I think, a kind of turning point in her life. And then she came back. She worked a lot with the uh, trade union uh, issues in uh, Chennai and with women workers. So uh, she built up the uh, union uh, and uh, the women workers associations also. And then she also uh, moved ahead and started working on gender issues and women's rights issues because she realized that was also very necessary. When she did all this, um, you know, uh, in those early days, in the initial days, I mean, she would just sort of uh, get into uh, the instances of violence against uh, individuals, violence against people, and she would um, document it. And on the basis of that document, they would put it together into demands and then they would mobilize around it. So this was the sort of thing that she did. And uh, she was, uh, uh, I think, uh, in that way, um, she uh, created a link between what was happening on the ground and between the way in which the state was also complicit in, the, in this whole exploitation of uh, common people. Can you tell us some uh, about some of the movements that she led? Kirman Mani, yeah, she got uh, quite disturbed by that and she took it up. But what about Vachati and what about uh, criminalizing the, what was known as Eve teasing and some of those movements? Yeah, so Maithili actually uh, went in to uh, uh, you know, study and intervene on a wide range of issues. Um, you know, uh, one of the uh, initial issues, which I also remember very well, because those days we were also very young and uh, we were working with uh, uh, leaders like uh, Maithili, Papa Omanath, etc. And uh, one issue that was coming up at that time, this was, I think, uh, you know, uh, late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, um, was this whole issue of sex selective abortion female feticide and infanticide, as it was called at that time, female feticide. So in and around Salem and some places around Madurai, etc. So what we uh, were uh, made to do, and Maithili was one of those who guided us, go there, conduct a survey amongst the uh, hamlets over there and see what is happening. And we discovered to our horror that whole families were part of this. The women also were part of this. So we came back with this survey and then Maithili put it together and she pointed out that the women also are victims of the system which sees women as a burden, a capitalist system which the women carry this whole thing and actually also uh, gets the woman uh, as an agency uh, in this. So she explained that and she showed that you cannot blame the victim for something that is happening to her. So that's how we developed an understanding. And then we also had major movements and struggles around that whole issue of uh, sex selective abortion it was one major issue with her. Even later, KP Janaki Amal Trust was set up. And one of the things that we did was try to uh, intervene in households where uh, two or three female children were there. and. Uh, um, a possibility of, uh, you know, killing off that third child was into such uh, families and tried to do uh, something to change the circumstances over there. And uh, similarly, in this whole uh, 
you know the the uh, sexual harassment issues of uh, eve teasing so in uh, many places in tamil nadu also eve teasing is not looked upon was not looked upon as a major crime you know it's you know it's just a little a uh, little bit of teasing what's wrong with it but uh, maithili showed how it was actually a violation of the woman's uh, right uh, to her person and it cannot be accepted and we had some very major movements on that because of which uh, law itself uh, was changed and the other thing i want to mention that because that's another very uh, important thing that we did at that time how we took on state violence see uh, there was a case uh, of uh, um, this um, seeralan this uh, emergency days uh, the police uh, murdered a uh, boy and then uh, and on, in those days there was no justice for youngsters who were being killed or uh, disposed of by the uh, state police uh, similarly in another in that pachati case it was the um, uh, police themselves is the forest uh, uh, guards who went into uh, uh, the woods in search of veerappan you know there was a big decoy over there those days uh so they went ostensibly searching for veerappan but they landed up gang raping a whole tribal hamlet adivasi women whole adivasi women they were uh, sexually molested and raped gang raped it was a terrible incident and after that you know there was uh, no action in that maithili went in and along with edwa we did a very major intervention and along with other organizations they are tribal rights organizations etc so that case was filed it went on and on and on and mind you after 19 years uh, the court ruled that yes the police were culpable and they should be punished and the women so it, it took 19 long years but my three set that uh, actually into motion and of course edwa was also there as part of it i remember going to the court at that time standing with the women who were speaking up they were terrified but they spoke up bravely so that is a and, and one more thing one more major movement was this anti untouchability movement you know there was this two glass system where you had a set of glasses for the um, uh, upper castes and the uh, other castes and you had a separate glass in tea shops in rural hamlets you had a separate glass for the uh, dalits uh, the scsts so uh, when we went in and discovered these things then we took this up and maithili was very much there uh, in, in uh, taking up uh, many of these uh, struggles against untouchability forms of untouchability practices of untouchability so i must say that in many of these things a kind of guidance a kind of leadership came from there from maithili now we will never forget the role that she played in tamil nadu in the way that we took up all those issues over the years I'm sure there is a whole lot, a whole list of other movements that she would have led, but I think this gives us a gist of uh, the things that she has, uh, uh, the movements that she has led. But you are you are somebody who worked very closely with her for I think forty years, I suppose. Yeah, you know the passing of my, you know how many lives she touched, how many youngsters she inspired and brought into the movement. I don't think we can even sort of. Uh, Uh, find out because now you know when people are writing in from all corners saying I knew her in this way. This is the uh, she spoke this over here, and I was so uh, motivated by that. From a lot of places, these kind of messages are coming in, and I myself was uh, greatly motivated. She used to come to Etraj where I was studying at that time, and she used to take uh, you know just a kind of. Uh, um uh, it wasn't a class it was more a discussion under the trees over there explaining how uh you know uh, the oppression of women gender oppression uh, is invisible to the eye what are its roots what are the roots of gender exploitation so the great quality about maithili which really inspired and motivated people like me was the, the way that she could explain the roots of the kind of uh, uh oppressions the kind of uh, inequalities that were being suffered by the people and this theory she would be link up into practice and that is what gave us the ability to take up those issues and to educate ourselves also and another thing about 
been um, the uh, she she was everyone's friend. She she would go out of her way. Uh, her house was open house. We would uh, be able to land up any time. We could have discussions with her. We could ask her lot of questions. We did ask her. You know, there was a time when this whole literacy movement, Arivoli Yekam in Tamil Nadu, but total literacy movement, all India level, where we went into education. Now, education was one of Maitri's passions. She wanted actually to go in. But this total literacy campaign was along with the government. So we had a large discussion. What does it mean when we go along with the government? Is it, you know, helpful? Will it work for progressive uh, uh, advancement? And that is when, you know, we thrashed it out. And she uh, pointed out that in itself, literacy for women is, uh, can be a tool of empowerment, can be a tool where they learn to question, where they learn to understand. And that was really something at that time we were able to therefore uh, do a widespread uh, total literacy campaign. And so many youngsters, young girls, they all came out in that. And even now, some of them are leaders of this movement. So it is the sort of inspiration that Maithili gave uh, to different sections and the, uh, you know, the warmth. But she could be very steely. She could be very determined on some things. Now, I remember there was one uh, marriage. Now, in marriages, we, uh, we insist on very simple you know, uh, marriages, no ritual, etc. Now, this in one uh, over-enthusiastic uh, 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 style, so they were sort of uh, giving all our uh, women, uh, you know, saris and so on. And she just uh, said, why? What about the expenditure to that family? This is not okay. Then in another instance, I remember. So there was this uh, NGO, you know, large NGOs from outside. And they were holding this thing on uh, poverty and linkages with uh, rural uh, poverty, rural uh, uh, situation, etc. And they held it in this five-star hotel, I think, in uh, Chennai. And she went there and the first thing before she started and she made a brilliant intervention there. But before she started, she said, so we must uh, find a different uh, place, a different platform where we can hold these discussions. Holding it in five star comfort will not allow us to come to the heart of the problem. And she said it in front of all those, uh, you know, a big, uh, you know, all the. Uh, big people who had come from all these NGOs, etc. So she never hesitated to speak her mind, very uncompromising on these things. But when a woman approached her, when one of our activists approached her, she was always there, always with a smile, so gentle, so unassuming. And she taught us that leadership is not about positions. Leadership is not about power. Leadership is about getting the people to recognize the roots of uh, gender oppression, come together uh, and organize and fight for change. I think that is the uh, great lesson that I got from my three, and I will never forget it. Never forget her. And I, I hope that I'll be able to uh, continue in some way, some part of the legacy that has been handed down to us by leaders like my three. Just to listen to these things, these small, uh, small snippets is very inspiring. So. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing uh, uh, these um, uh, these things about uh, Maithi Shivaraman. Thank you very much for being there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. There's so much more to be said some other time and some other yeah. uh, people also. Thank you very much. <laughs>